So hello everyone, this is Joe Brewer, the director of the Center for Applied Cultural Evolution. I'm sorry that I can't join you in person, but my family is traveling today during the conference and uh, we're not able to come and be with you in person and I'm really sorry about that. But I'm still delighted and honored to have the opportunity to share with you my vision for how the field of cultural evolution can provide a design science for the planetary crisis that we're in, which is related to the need for creating economic systems that embody the principles of living systems that are so central to this conference. So thank you all so much for inviting me to be here, and I wish that I could be with you in person. Now let me begin by putting in context one of the biggest patterns of the 20th century, or really of the last three centuries that I think is really important for us to keep in mind. This graph captures it really powerfully, which is that as a set of historical cultural changes caused the human population to grow exponentially, starting somewhere around the year 1800 and really taking off in the 1940s and 1950s, that the increasing complexity of human societies came with it a corresponding reduction in the complexity of ecosystems all across the planet. And one way to measure this is by looking at the rate of extinction. And you can see that as the human population grew and we converted more complex ecosystems into degraded landscapes in service to agriculture and cities and industrial processes, that the biodiversity loss going with it was deeply coupled and that there's a very profound relationship that needs to be disentangled and understood that connects the rise in human population and social complexity with the loss of ecological complexity. Seen in an even broader view, as we can through the planetary boundaries framework presented here. And this graphic was created by the Stockholm Resilience Center, which is a collaboration among Earth system scientists, where they have identified nine key processes that they call planetary boundaries. And they've identified that if any one of these is crossed over a critical threshold, that it makes the possibility of a planetary scale human civilization untenable. Or said another way, this threshold for the nine different planetary boundaries defines a safe operating range for humanity at a planetary scale. And what we can see by looking at this graph is that we have already overshot several of these planetary boundaries, and we are currently at risk of a planetary scale systemic collapse. So exponential changes that we saw in the previous graph are represented here in things like the loss of genetic diversity, which is up in the upper portion that's going up to the left, which is a measure of biodiversity loss. Or if you can see down in the bottom with phosphorus and nitrogen, which are connected to industrial agriculture through the use of synthetic fertilizers. And land system change is also rapidly moving toward the danger zone, whereas climate change, even though it's getting a lot of attention in the press, still has some time delays before it crosses over the threshold for planetary civilization. So you can see that at a whole system level, we have destabilized many aspects of the planet and its human cultural systems or the impacts of collective human behaviors that are causing this. So why is it that the rapid changes in human systems have had such a profound effect on the Earth overall? I want to offer a very provocative idea, which I state this way. What if behavioral flexibility is the root cause of the Earth's ecological crisis? And normally we hear things like climate change is caused by the burning of fossil fuels, but that doesn't go deep enough to the root causes. So let's dig into this for a moment and, and I'll share with you what I mean. What is behavioral flexibility? Well, if you were to ask a psychologist 
to look at these three different images shown here and ask them, how flexible is each of these objects or uh, organisms for changing its behavior? You look at a rock, which is in the bottom left, and you say, well, a rock can have some behavior. If it comes loose, it will follow the path of gravity, and it will fall until it settles to a new position at a lower elevation. But it is incapable of changing its behavior by its own actions. So it has basically zero behavioral flexibility internal to itself. Whereas if you go to the right and see this plant, the plant has some behavioral flexibility because if you have a light source, like if it's facing toward the sun on the left, then the vines as they're growing will reach in the direction of the sun. But if you turn the plant around, the growth will move in the opposite direction. And it has some very limited flexibility to change its behavior in response to changing environmental conditions. But aside from this very limited behavioral flexibility, it's still pretty limited overall in what it can do. Whereas if you look at this mouse, this laboratory rat on the right, these animals are famous in psychology for all of the social experiments that can be conducted to see how they change their behaviors because the complex brain of a mammal, like a rodent or a lab rat, is able to learn new things from its experiences and then change its behaviors as it learns about new environments. So this idea of behavioral flexibility can be thought of as a range of internal capacities for an organism to change its behaviors within changing environments, or to change the environment and then adapt to the new environment by changing its behavior. Now if we look at humans, what we can see is that Throughout the evolution of our ancestral line of hominids, that behavioral flexibility increased with growing social and technological skills. So going back about two million years ago to what is called the Oldowan Tool Age, or Homo habilis, back when some of our ancestors began to use fairly rudimentary, yet at the same time quite sophisticated tools to help them with carving up of meat, so that they could eat it. Or later when they learned how to control fire and began to cook things, that with each new step of social and cognitive abilities came increased behavioral flexibility, which allowed our ancestors to increasingly change their environment to serve ourselves. And so this behavioral flexibility is a way of thinking about how the human animal the, the biological capacities of human beings enable us to change our behaviors with increasingly diverse repertoires. And this enables us to change which kinds of habitats we can survive in until eventually we became a planetary species by adapting with technologies and cultural adaptations to every possible environment that humans survive in today. Now add to this this very interesting feature of cultural evolution for humans, which is that after we learn things, what we've learned becomes a kind of structural scaffold for new innovation. And as you can see here with each later generation of automobiles, that they're not starting from scratch each time, but instead they're taking a previous design and all of its innovations and then adding a few improvements in this accumulation of technological innovations enables what is initially a slow pace of change to eventually become an exponential pace of change. So the ability for humans to change the planet at an exponential scale is deeply related to this cultural evolution capacity for building upon what came before. Applied at the large scale of human history, you can see that for most of our history, roughly 99% of the history of Homo sapiens, our ancestors lived in small tribal bands of hunter-gatherers. But when we started the Holocene geologic period about 10,000 years ago, in a few regions of the world, agriculture was developed, which substantially increased the complexity of those societies, leading to the establishment of permanent settlements, the initial city-states, growth of the populations living within them, increasing diversity of roles 
and functions that people could perform administratively and technologically, which increased the social complexity of those societies through a process of cumulative cultural evolution. But at the same time, this created a variety of new social niches or new environmental contexts that humans could invent new behaviors. So our capacity for behavioral flexibility grew with this increasing social complexity. And as this process continued to happen from generation to generation over the span of thousands of years, something really important occurred, which is that eventually this runaway process of cultural evolution in human minds created a planetary scale civilization, a planetary scale globalized economy that has destabilized Earth system functions in the 20th century. So when we looked at the planetary boundaries framework a few minutes ago, we can see that the human capacity to alter the entire planet was achieved sometime in the last 100 years, if not before. So, if we accept that behavioral flexibility is one of the root causes of the Earth's ecological crisis, well then behavioral flexibility is also our only way to avert disaster. What I mean by this is if we can use our knowledge of how to change our behavior in ways that embody wisdom and foresight and that uh, align human economic activities with the way that ecosystems function, as we're talking about in this conference on bioeconomy, that we have the ability to create cultural systems that are well adapted to the harmony of the Earth system, which means there is, at least in a theoretical sense, a possibility that we could achieve planetary sustainability. So imagine this. Imagine that every location on Earth where social change occurs which is everywhere that people are trying to make any changes at all, what if these places became field sites for cultural evolution research? So think about what a field site is. In anthropology, a field site is a place that a researcher goes to study the local culture. In ecology, a field site is a place where the ecologist goes to observe different specimens of plants, animals, or fungi to see what's there. But the important thing is that the field site remains a place of longitudinal or ongoing study to set up baseline measurements and track changes while also trying to understand the mechanisms driving those changes. This rich and complex tapestry of research tools for monitoring, evaluation, analysis, and interpretation can all be used to inform social change efforts. So when I talk about applied cultural evolution, this is what I mean. That we take the rigor of research and cultural evolution and bring it to the practices of social change so that we can address all of the ecological and social challenges of runaway cultural evolution that exist in the world today. So let me give a couple examples to show that this isn't really a new idea even though what's been done in the past often wasn't called applied cultural evolution, you can understand it through this lens. And a great example to start with is the, st is the field of public health. So over the last 100, 150 years, literally trillions of dollars have been spent worldwide to eradicate disease, promote the healthy development of children, make institutions more transparent and accountable, and a lot more. So fields like prevention science, epidemiology, disaster preparedness, behavioral science, cultural geography, and more, public policy as well. These are all areas where attempts to make social change more rigorous and effective are areas that have a huge body of practices and case studies that show that it can, at least within limited capacities, that it can be done effectively. Similarly, if we look at education, and we understand that education is a formalized and institutional version of something much more general. So one of the most developed arenas for cultural evolution research is the study of social learning in human and non-human species. So every school on the planet, in one form or another, 
teaches cultural narratives, social norms, ideas, ways of solving problems, ways of thinking, developing emotional capacities to process information, and a lot more that changes how social learning occurs at individual, community, and larger societal scales. So education in this broad way of understanding it is an area where a huge amount has been learned about how to apply cultural evolution at institutional scales. Another area that's maybe a little bit more questionable in its ethics, which brings up the importance of developing clear and robust ethical frameworks for participatory design, is the area of marketing. So in the early days, marketing was mostly about the manipulation of people's innate psychological capacities in order to sell products or to build brand identities. But over time, it is very evident that marketing and advertising have been extremely effective at changing the pathway of cultural evolution for entire societies and, quite honestly, the entire global economy. So if we think of marketing and advertising as areas of applied cultural evolution, we can see that there are a lot of tools and frameworks that we can draw upon that are effective at large scales. So now specifically applied to bioeconomics, we can apply things like the Capital Institute's framework for regenerative economics, which is a synthesis of knowledge about living systems as it's applied to how humans might design our economic systems. We now know a great deal about the biological organisms and ecological functions of networks of relationships between species at various scales from the study of living systems. When you add the tools of complexity research and the tools of evolution, then we begin to have the capacity to design economic systems that have the living systems capacity to regenerate themselves from moment to moment. And this is something that shows great promise for the future as an area of applied cultural evolution. In my own work, I have a very specific and very ambitious goal, which is to help people understand that if we join forces between all of the learning centers, universities, permaculture camps, uh, eco-villages, transition towns, and so forth, about how to guide social change, that we can direct it toward shared planetary scale goals. For example, in this map, you can see all of the degraded soils on Earth. And what it shows us is a target that if we were to regenerate and end the degradation, restore the health of all of these landscapes at a planetary scale, we could bring ourselves back within the planetary boundaries of the Stockholm Resilience Center's framework and help to create a regenerative economic system at a planetary scale. Now, part of the work that I'm doing is to try to coordinate this through the idea of creating bioregional scale economic systems that organize themselves with local learning centers that map out and guide the evolution of their regions while collaborating with each other from region to region to achieve planetary scale outcomes. This is the work that we're doing now at the Center for Applied Cultural Evolution. And we're doing it in what we call the Design Institute for Regenerating Earth, which is just beginning and has a lot of work still to be done. But the idea is to weave a collaborative tapestry of learning centers across the planet that share this vision of regenerating the entire Earth. So if this is something that you're interested in and you'd like to get involved, well, that's something I would be very happy to talk about. I'd like to end on a personal note and say that we owe it to future generations to do the very best we can to safeguard our collective future as a globalized species, as humanity, and also for the biodiversity of all other living things. So here's a picture of me holding my daughter, who is now almost three years old. She was one year old, one and a half, when I took this picture. But I just wanted to say that this is something that I take very personally and I hold in my heart as a sacred purpose for my own work in building bioeconomic systems that can regenerate the Earth. So if you're interested in talking with me about any of this or getting involved in some way, please reach out to me at this contact information, and I look forward to talking with you at some point in the future.
Thank you very much.